Okay, hello. Okay, so my name is Ratish. Apparently some of you guys paid to be here. Uh, I feel like Barry Manilow. You guys are just buying tickets. Uh, this is my experience, a bunch of logos. Um, so what do you guys see when you, when you look at this? See an ear? See, for me, I see a V and a G, right? I see a V right here. I see a G, right? Type is everywhere. Van Gogh Museum, right? Maybe it's better if it's red. Would it be better if it was Miro? No, I made it. <laughs> this is me when I was little. Um, I'm not a typography, but I, uh, typographer, but I see type everywhere. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, when I was little, I used to think that the reason I had brown skin was because I drank chocolate milk instead of white milk. Um, and I was super lazy. Um, and yeah, this is going to be fun. We have like 138 slides of this, so get ready. Uh, when I was little, I used to like try to figure out ways to hack my life. So I wanted to be a fire dog instead of a firefighter, just so I can like sit pretty, like look good on the fire engine. Uh, and when I was working at an agency, <coughs> Wyden and Kennedy, um, I actually got taken away in the ambulance because I worked too hard, got stuck with a $4,000 bill. Uh, so that's me. Uh, this is basically me, right? I paid eight dollars for the stock photos. So you guys better laugh. Um, TDC like really cares about excellence and growth in community, but uh, the thing I really want to talk about is growth. Um, this type, sh this talk should feel really hyped, so it should feel really energetic. Uh, type, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, considered sometimes pretentious or whatever, but it's actually really, really fucking cool. Uh, and I hope that if you're not interested in type, you will be by the end of this talk. Uh, just as kind of like a palate cleanser. Uh, like, type is really beautiful, right? Like, look at this G. Like, look at that slant right there, right? Like, look, oh my god, look at this. Q, look at this A. Like, the at symbol. Type can be really beautiful. So if you ever, like, look at a sign, like, when you're walking down the street or um, have an agency who has really boring type, just upgrade that shit. Um, so a little bit of, uh, about what I want to talk about. I want to talk a little bit about the insights that I have on the Pet Plate rebrand, which is one a thing that I recently created, directed uh, with Sagmeister and Walsh, and actually some of the individuals that are here. Um, I'm really, really getting choked up, the fact that like, you guys are down to like, see me talk uh, while also like, working on it for like, hours and hours and hours. Uh, and then also like, my point of view on like, the future of type. Um, I have a few different hypotheses. Um, I think hyperfluid relationships between client and agency or client and typographer or client and other clients are like super necessary for better work. Um, but at the same time, I think this hyperfluidity should be like, like interrupted by like super, super intense periods of complete solitude. Um, and I also think that like we really need to be exploring the craziest option in brand identity, typography, et cetera, production, whatever, in order to find the best option. And oftentimes they're, they're the same. Um, and lastly, I think if we don't address the underlying issues within the type industry, it's going to fail and struggle to grow as large as I know it can be. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, Pet Plate. So we're in the classic uh, situation where like, we're spending a ton of money on Facebook ads, ton of money on Instagram ads, and we just like, weren't seeing that good of return on investment, and we really need to upgrade uh, compared to our comp competition. Our competition had spent like, $75 million uh, compared to us, and like, we were just really the underdog. So we need to think about like how could we upgrade. So uh, the, the direction we took was upgrading our product and upgrading our brand. Um, and the process that we took was like not unlike a lot of things that like a lot of brand identity uh, clients or clients in need of brand identity need to make. Um, so I really want to hope. I really hope that if you're a typographer um, or you're a brand identity person or you're just a random person, like you really start to think a little bit more deeply about like what the right process is and like how the process that you might be taking uh, in your life for, for identity uh, could be better. So uh, first thing is clients, in order to have the wherewithal to actually rebrand, they actually have to have money, right? They actually have to have some sort of budget, some sort of resourcing in, in order to do it. Um, I emailed a bunch of agencies um, and the ones, the, I'm not going to tell you the number of agencies because it will probably be in, insane, and I'm actually not going to say that number because it's kind of scary. Um, we, the ones that got the furthest were actually the ones who responded the same day, and that was Sagmeister and Walsh. Um, 
we had an initial call with most of them. We usually do the, the normal rigmarole where like a client, an agency would be like hard selling, being like, oh, check out how dope this Uber rebrand is or like check out how dope this like McDonald's rebrand was. And I'm like, I know your work. You don't have to hard sell me on it. Sag and Walsh, like we, they just, Jessica Walsh just brought me into a shop and was like, hey, let's talk. Let's have a conversation. Talk to me about what your issues are and I'll talk to, be, talk to you about how much I love my dog, Oscar. Um, and then before we signed the contract, this is super atypical. I shared specific, specific aesthetics that we loved and hated um, and why. So for example, I really did not want to go like super brutalist in the typography. I did not want to go super pretentious with like the branding and color scheme. And Jessica was like, wow, no one has really done this before, but like I'm in it, let's, let's do it, right? So it was really important to share before we sign the actual contract with any agency, including Sag and Walsh, like that the client is super comfortable with like where the, where the stuff is gonna go. Now, of course, if a client is like doesn't really know good stuff and like there's a common situation where like you have to work with people with bad taste and that's like another talk, um, like normally you, there's somebody in the company that has somewhat good taste and can somewhat direct like, hey, this is good typography, this is bad typography, et cetera, et cetera. When we signed the contract, I literally walked it over to their office, like who the hell does that? No one does that, right? But again, this is an example of like fluidity, like just being super down to clown. Um, we did a ton of research. Um, some of the research that we found uh, that we gave to SAG like really helped uh, with the work. Like we identified the fact that um, dogs can only see a certain color spectrum. They can't see our competitors' colors. They can't see red. They can't see green. They can see blue, white, yellow, et cetera, and those became some of our colors. Now, can, can dogs actually see RGB blue? Unclear, but whatever. It's inspiration and it's post-rationalization, right? Um, so we looked at like all of the brands here. Um, you have like really bad typography. Um, going on here, you have uh, this kind of uh, uh, trash. Um, uh, the, uh, there's two R's, um, just misspellings. There's a lot of like moans and groans, right? Like solid gold is decent. It reminds you of a little bit of like the tails of a dog, but like eh, you've got like aerial bold rounded. It's like pretty trash, right? So we were, this was our original um, brand. It was like copper plate black or something like that. It was like whatever. Um, <laughs> Then, like after this process of like hyperfluidity, like sharing research and all this stuff, saying like, "Hey, do you like this? Do you like this? I hate this. I hate this, et cetera, et cetera." There was a period of like intense, intense solitude, wherein like the client, myself, had to just like wait and like trust that the trust that they were going to kill it, and they knocked it out of the park. Um, Jessica Walsh basically popped out in like four four weeks and was like hey, we've got something to show you. They presented a 122-page deck, which was insane. Like, on round one, it's pretty much unheard of. Um, but we trusted them. We knew, like, that the aesthetics were, uh, that we hated were not going to be presented, and the aesthetics that we loved were going to be inspiration. That was huge. Um, then I had to corral a bunch of feedback from coworkers and customers and investors. This is a really hard thing, especially when you're working with people who just have an opinion. Like, if you go to somebody on their street and you just say, like, hey, what's your opinion on this? Nine times out of 10, it's just an opinion that they're just gonna say because you asked them. So it's really important to like, and I know this is kind of controversial, but like there's evidence to believe this, is like don't listen to users, watch them. So what I mean by that is like don't listen to like the gobbledygook that often comes out of people's mouths. Actually watch their behavior because they might, they might say something that's fundamentally different than what they're actually doing. Um, I sent a huge Google Doc, much to their chagrin, with feedback. I think it was like, 10 pages, 15 pages, I don't really remember, but it was one single space, it was a lot of feedback. A lot of it was like clarifying, like, hey, why'd you do this? Or could we do this? Could we push this? Could we do that? And a lot of, I think it's really important not to argue on taste, right? So the first thing that, that first reaction wasn't like, this is a really cool look. It was more like, hey, can you explain your rationalization for like why you chose this thing? And that, be, that allows for a much more, like less defensive conversation, a lot more productive conversation. The worst thing that could happen is a client being like, hey, can you make that bigger, right? Um, we were fine across four rounds. Uh, this was written in the contract to protect both parties. Uh, then we basically like did photo shoots and animations and a, and a bunch of all that stuff. Um, so the result was we killed it, uh, basically. I won't go into the details, but we crossed it. Um, so let's look at the work, right? So we were really inspired by dog culture. Um, the, yeah, this is like, ah, right? <laughs> Come on, you got like a Dotson spinning on something um, and Golden Retriever. Yeah, you could just sit on this for the rest, the next 54 minutes. Um, 
And like they're super lovable and goofy and they see the world differently. Like they ride way lower than we can and like their perception of the world is way different. Um, we're gonna come back to the, the dog at the bottom left. That's Winston, he's a little piece of shit. Um, <laughs> Like dogs do like things. Uh, they don't necessarily do this because they're not that extra, but when a human like sets them up in this way, they're gonna look really cute, right? Um, and then we're really inspired by like traditional human style plates, right? We've seen these ever since we were little. Um, so like our differentiators were like to humanize them, like show that they have a lot of pleasure, not erotic pleasure, but like pleasure, um, and like to make it easy. Actually, funny enough, there was a, <laughs> speaking of pleasure, uh, <laughs> Uh, there was a dog uh, that had this really large erection on our on our shoot, and you remember this, Henry? Uh, this greyhound, and uh, we were actually it was like this big lipstick, right? Uh, and so I don't know why I'm saying this because it's being recorded, but it's fine. <laughs> Uh, and so I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to create an ad of like showing this huge sensor bar over uh, the dog's um, lipstick to show like the pet plate effect, right? Like just like fun things like that. Uh, all right, so here's where the brand became. Uh, it's a word mark. Uh, it says the word pet and plate. Um, this was the first like iteration of it. Ooh, so different, right? Uh, this is the blue is the from here until like. 7, 10, I don't know why I'm telling you the timing, you're not timing this, but for the next three minutes, uh, I'll show you like where we were and where we, became, where we came. So blue is the first round, red is the second round, green is the third round. Make sense? Cool. So again, this is red, this is red overlaid on top, again, right? And I'll just keep going back and forth so you can see the differences, right? So again, uh, blue was uh, the final one, uh, red was the first round. So. The thing that I really saw immediately was the fact that the stems of the P and the L and the stems of the T's are not aligned. Do you guys see that? Like non-typographers, do you see that, right? So like this and this are like not 100% aligned, this and this are not 100% aligned. So my first, one of my first bits of feedback was like, can we align them? And Jessica was like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so the problem with that though is all the different letter forms like have to change too. It's not just simply like, poof, this is gonna like just happen. A lot of things have to happen. So this, then we came up with the green one, right? And dramatically different. So you'll see that like the P, the bowls of the P right here were a lot larger than on the third round. And this is an example of like going extreme, right? We wanted to try to align them, which we did, but like we went a little too extreme, right? Again, this is this idea of like taking the branding to the extreme and seeing like where it works and where it falls flat. But I really like this idea of the P's, if you put on the side, they kind of look like tongues of dogs. So I didn't want it to like be like this execution, right? This is the green, third round, second round, third round, second round, right? And then this is where we ended up. So the green was the like the most extreme version, most extreme execution of it, and then this is where we came. Ah, right? All right, cool. Uh, then we did the horizontal version too. Uh, and you could see like how dramatic like just trying to align things like actually makes things. Right, like just simply saying, "Hey, can you align the T's for the the stacked version?" Like dramatically changed how the the horizontal version was executed. Make sense? Right. Let's see, look at that. Pretty dramatic, right? So it's like this idea of like hyper fluid, like client agency relationships, being super open to pushing this thing as far as it could become, and then being like, "That doesn't feel quite right. Let's kind of settle somewhere in the middle." The really good thing about that is if you ask your agency to like go to the extreme, they'll actually make them pretty happy because oftentimes clients will choose the middle option. <laughs> so if you can take this thing to really extremes, you could probably be really happy with like the middle option that you had to settle for. Just like a little psychological thing. Did you know that like the wine like on a menu, the, the most popular wine is the second most expensive wine, right? Because the guy doesn't want to look cheap for buying the cheap wine, right? So you go to the middle option. People like the middle option. Okay, then we created like this animation, right? So this idea of like looking at the P as the dog tongue, right? All these little insights started like coming alive. Uh, this was done by Andy Baker Studio, who does some incredible work if you ever need animations or if you want a job. Um, now, the inspiration was this dog right here, which is Winston. Uh, if you ever recognize the, the word pet plate or recognize either of them, they were actually on Shark Tank a couple years ago, the ABC show um, with, uh, with sharks. Um, this dog is like a little, he's a little piece of shit. Like he, um, he's, he has IBS, so he poops everywhere. It smells really bad. Yeah, anybody else have IBS? Yeah, it's rough. Um, 
he, um, like, during the actual Shark Tank pitch, he was, like, looking the opposite way. Like, this is the biggest, like, away from the Sharks. This was, like, the biggest moment of, like, Ronaldo, who is this guy's career, and Winston, like, was being a little shit and, like, running off the set. Um, but, like, he started, like, being the inspiration for a lot of things. Like, we put him literally on the box because so many customers were used to this idea of Winston and the fact that Ronaldo started this thing for Winston. So we try to, like, figure out, like, all these little things. Like, yes, dogs are humanized and, like, dogs should, like, show erotic pleasure, et cetera, et cetera. But, like, also Winston was at the heart of this thing. So we're like, hey, if we can be inspired by Winston, let's like have Winston design a typeface as it were, right? So we chose this typeface called Separat, um, which is like absolutely beautiful out of uh, or type in, in Europe. Um, this is like where we uh, like ended up and I'm super happy with it. The letter forms are, uh, are super beautiful. Um, this was the original typeface. Um, the Separat literally is separate, right? Um, in European. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> So like the bees like are really separated. They kind of like like boobs. Um, you were thinking it, right? Uh, the six and the nine like it, the six actually kind of looks like a like a bee, right? The nine looks a little uh, like a backwards P. So it can be problematic for people who have trouble like uh, with vision. So this was the original separate, right? And then we're like, hey, can we modify this thing? So we we ended up modifying it here. So we started closing these bowls a little bit. Like the bees no longer look like breasts. Looks kind of like a like a butt, uh, and this is overlaid, right? So we started also playing with the spacing, kerning, etc. For you type nerds, um, the three, six, nine, eight are super dramatic in terms of being different, right? Um, so it's helped with readability, and then we ended up going with he this, um, right? So the letter forms like the four, the bar goes down to m match up with the the five. So what we did again was we took this third round and pushed it as far as we could. And they're like, hey, or type, do you think we can like modify this a little bit more to, to fit within the original look of separate? Okay, cool. Then we're like, hey, dogs, again, see, I, I knew you guys were gonna love this, so I put it back in here. Um, <laughs> dogs are kind of naive, right? They're little shits, uh, they, they have tails sometimes, and like, how could we use body type to, um, to be inspired? So we chose anarchy, which is one of my favorite typefaces. I think this is just gonna be like my typeface of like, Ratish. Um, a uh, brilliant designer, Paul Catterall, uh, I think out of Vienna. Um, I really, really love this typeface. Like, look at this R. Oh, Madonna Mia, look at this R. <laughs> right, look how beautiful it is. It kind of reminds me of a tail, right? Kind of like an Afghan uh, hound. Oh, Madon. <laughs> right. Oh. oh, geez, that R. Right, then we got some like Sopranos guests, Madonna Mia, Tony, super happy, Paulie, super happy, eh. <laughs> Right, oh, look at that. Right, ooh, Madon. Right, the R, look, reminds me a little bit of dog's tails. Look at Judith Light. Doesn't that dog look like Judith Light? <laughs> right? If any of you guys are like not impressed, you're probably the dog on the left, the top left right here, just like not having that grind. Uh, then you got like this T, look how harsh it is, like this BDSM like dog, right? Like it's kind of harsh. So you have like this R that's like kind of delicate, then you have this T that's kind of harsh. It's like, oh, oh, what? Look at all these gifts. Come on, who doesn't like, ooh, ah, uh, ooh. Right? All right, then we like put it on boxes, uh, right? So we have boxes. Uh, we put, oh, hi, doggy, right? Healthy f dog food for real. People really like this um, kind of look, especially like since our boxes were like advertisements in New York City, et cetera. Um, each box kind of had like a different, like we had small, medium, large, extra large boxes. We put like Chihuahua for the small box and like a larger dog for the larger box. So again, like all of these like little small moments of humanizing dogs started coming out. Now, yes, like the dog in this day and age, it's not, it's not 2017 anymore, should not be wearing like wired ear earbuds, but like, come on, like it's, it's fine. Uh, this is like a concept image uh, or video rather. I'll just like let you guys look at it. Like look how extra that dog's being, right? Like we just didn't care. Spinning food, like putting the food in spinning animations. I don't know why I explain that. <laughs> right, Winston wearing a hat, like being like the customer service person, which is like <laughs> lit as fuck. 
right? Parallax, oh man, haven't seen that since 2010, right? <laughs> Uh, and then like typing dog, right? Like it's just fun stuff. Like all again, like all this hyperfluidity like was super important. And I think SAG like pushes work really, really well. But I think it definitely did not hurt that we were super open, um, right? Then we just like made signs. Like what a great, what a great line, right? <laughs> um, when I first started, saw this line of like great dumps start with great food, my initial reaction was like, ah, dumps just doesn't seem on brand, right? Uh, it's just like dumps. Could we say poops? And 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 Jessica was like, no, it's got to be dumps. Uh, and I'm glad we kept it, right? We got an IKEA dog bag, right? Just use that for laundry, not the dog, but the bag, right? Uh, we had a secondary color palette, okay, right? Then we like started like interpreting the goofiness and wonkiness in in like photography, right? Like we worked with some amazing people. Uh, Henry's in the audience uh, to do photography, and then Charlotte Omne to do food styling. And we're like, hey. What what you got? Like here's the branding. Like what could we do? And she was like, Hey, let's do this idea of Freaky Bana. Are you guys familiar with Freaky Bana? Yes. Cool. One person. Cool. Great. So, <laughs> Freaky Bana is basically this idea of like this chaotic yet beautiful way of arranging things. And we we're like, you know what? Let's let's explore this. I think this funky like whimsical nature of of uh, food photography hasn't really been done in a long time. So I'm really excited about it. Um, we made emo emojis. Like look at that. I peeked. There's a heart in the butt, right? Oh. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah. Originally there was a tail, but we're like, there's a heart in there. Let's let's keep that. And then like, there's some typography like in here, right? Uh, right. And that was the that was the old separate. So forgive us, but like, it's it's separate. Um, and like we this image was probably what maybe like 20 30 images we wanted to kind of make it look like dogs learn how to use photoshop we didn't want it to be like perfect perfect we wanted it to be look like kind of slightly off which i think paid off in the end all right great so let's talk about like my point of view on the future um this is going to get a little heavy so um the type industry actually has a lot of problems and there's a lot of symptoms in the type industry uh when i was little like i didn't even know what fonts were um and it was, it's like very difficult for like my parents to wrap their heads around the fact that I like, I work in design or work in typography or anything because I'm a disgrace because uh, I'm not an engineer or a doctor, right? Um, <laughs> so there's cultural issues, uh, which is basically number two with lack of diversity, but like there's also other symptoms too. It's really hard to find the right font um, for, for your project and you probably had this issue too. It's really hard to make money in typography and there's a really big lack of awareness of the impact of type. Um, so I want to dig into that a little bit. Um, there's underlying reasons for all of those four, right? So people are uneducated about type. It's hard to stay updated on new fonts. Font organization, UI, and UX is super broken. Um, font contexts often change, making it really difficult to fall in love with a typeface because you don't know if it's going to be co-opted by Nazis. Um, <laughs> it's true, and I'll explain it. Um, there's a lack of representation in the industry, which is obviously de diversity related um, and inclusion and equity related. The traditional business model is like absolutely yikes. And we all, again, we don't know the true business value of type. So let's go through each of these things. Um, so I think generally before I go on though, it's, it's a four pronged problem. It's marketing problem. Uh, it's a design and UX problem. It's a social problem. Um, and it's also a business problem. So I think that we can totally fix these issues together. Um, TDC is doing an amazing job at working on this, and we can do even better, right? So this is like how people describe fonts. Oh my god, I love Helvetica. Like, have you seen that movie, right? Like, that's like maybe a dinner conversation. If you haven't seen that movie, you're like, who the hell is this person? Like, why would you why, like see a movie on Helvetica, right? Or it'd be like, hey, that font kind of reminds me of like Allbirds. Like, no thanks, I hate it. Or like people will describe fonts as like, ooh, that feels premium, like whatever that word means, right? <laughs> but like how the industry describes fonts, and I'm not gonna like, uh, I, I purposely removed the actual font name, but these are like real descriptions. Like font name is an extravagant sans serif workhorse. It blends the worlds of rational tool and or ornamentation by applying techniques used to optimize type for small sizes in a, in a refined way. Oh, I already got one person leaving, great. Um, <laughs> Uh, font name is the result of an extensive investigation into display serif typefaces from the 70s and 80s. It focuses on the expressive and idiosyncratic nature of calligraphic motions compelled into stable typographic shapes. What the hell? <laughs> like, is, like, I, okay, I get it. Like, I recognize some roots of these words, but, like, what? 
Font name is a monoline grotesque constructed using rigid elements to achieve a minimalist industrial feel in homage to early 20th century modernist con design concepts, right? Like, does this mean premium? Like, what, like, uh, like, can you just get me Albert's typeface? Like, what does this mean, right? Um, and like, what I would say like to the type industry, <laughs> all you 50 people, is like, how could we leverage user experience and user design thinking to actually show what fonts mean to specific people? Like, if typographers could actually go out to people, like let's say a 1,000 people, and say like, hey, describe this font, and then put that, those word clouds into the actual UI when you're choosing a font, like that will help align what people think like as normal plebes who are like don't know fonts with actually how people describe them. So keep describing stuff as this, bury that in the UI for like the people who are actually like buying the typeface. But like for the people who are uneducated, we should be using like word clouds, user design research, et cetera. It's also really hard to stay updated on the new font. Like in this age of Trump, like do I really care about like the next typography like that just got released? Um, or do I care about like saving lives, right? And like that people like are not getting killed, right? So like, I want to do both. Like, I want to be able to stay up to, na uh, to new date on news on both like social well-being and on typography, right? So we need to figure out like how to align demand with supply. Um, and I think this is uh, I think Monotype's uh, Instagram feed, like the real like nine tiles. Like, I don't really want to follow like nine posts about Helvetica, to be honest. Like, like it's a nice okay typeface. Um, like, again, if you asked me like five years ago, I think I liked it, but eh. um, But like, I don't want to see this in my feed. I mean, again, I don't have an Instagram, but like, <laughs> I wouldn't want to see this in my feed. What I would want to see is like utilizing like letter, letter forms and like using Helvetica to give me something that's actually valuable, right? So this is where a marketing problem comes in. Like if I could follow Monotype or any of these foundries, my fonts, et cetera, all that stuff, um, and it like actually gave me valuable like information about like what I care about. Like, hey, did you know that like looking at the color green could actually in increase your creativity or something that's interesting to me that helps me understand value and being like, oh, hey, by the way, I just realized that Helvetica just got released in the caption, right? Like, I think we really need to be bringing meaning to like these marketing platforms. Also, finding fonts is really hard. Like, if I just type in fonts, you get fonts.com, Google Fonts. Defont, thousand fonts, free fonts, baby, uh, cool fancy text generator, and then hot new fonts. Like, trust me, I clicked on these. They're purple, right? They're purple links. They're not blue links. Trust me, I investigated. I've clicked on these things. Um, and like, once you click on one of these things, this is Google, right? Um, once you like go onto the Google UI, it becomes really difficult and really constricting of like what I want to see. Like, I don't necessarily care. Um, what the font properties are, or the language it's in, or or categories, um, as much as like what's the meaning behind this typeface, or like what is it going to represent if I put it on my site. So I think there's a really big UX opportunity here, where like a Google or a Defont or a Fonts.com could leverage like actual UX best practices to update this. So in instead of just seeing these three things, I would love to have a word cloud or or like other similar brands. On here again, it's really hard to find a, a, a typeface. It's easier for me because I've been in this industry for um, three months. Um, <laughs> but it's hard for like the normal person. Um, okay, if you click on like if you type in cool fonts, this is the first thing that shows up, right? The SEO in here is so good. Like I don't know how it's better than like anything that's reputable, right? Like this is not cool, right? Like I literally typed in this isn't cool. This is terrible. <laughs> Um, we're gonna come back to Froctor in a sense in, in later. It's it's a racist font, um, which should not be on here. Um, so, is anyone interested in like helping me fix this problem? Like making some sort of spreadsheet, putting all our favorite fonts on there, organizing in a cool way? Like, just hit me up. Um, Context is really complicated when it comes to typefaces. Black letter was originally used in Latin context for like Bibles, uh, like in the middle, but like it's starting to morph into various contexts. Uh, it was utilized by Hitler um, to do what he did, and that uh, I refuse to put his picture up here. Um, it was used uh, in various other contexts. It's now started to be appropriated by street culture, right? And we really have to grapple with this, fa this fact that originally this typeface was used in a biblical sense. It then morphed into 
um, this racial uh, uh, racial need, uh, and then now it's being co-opted by like people of color to like leverage on their on their shirts and selling it for like a lot of money. Like I'm wondering, do we as a type industry, do we have an obligation to consider historical context when choosing fonts? I don't know. This is like an open question, but it's a really important one, um, and it's going to prevent our our industry from being taken seriously when anybody and their mother can just like put Pablo onto a, a uh, onto an album, Kanye West, um, or put ASAP like on ASAP Rocky's thing without any sort of like intellectual discussion. Now, of course, context around typography, like all that, like that debate is like a super privileged debate, right? Like it's a really hard, like it's I get it, but like we really have to think about truly like when we choose type. What's the historical context behind it, and how do we help inform people who are not familiar with uh, specific typefaces um, to consider it? Mic drop. Okay. Uh, then we have this issue of diversity, right? We have this issue of diversity, inclusion, and equity. And the fact that there's very few people of color, um, queer folk, and, and women, and non-binary people is like pretty alarming. Um, and I want to just like explain that uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity is like super hard to define. So I want to define it a little bit. So the way I do, the way I like to define it is an analogy. So diversity is going to a party, inclusion is being part of the party planning committee, and then equity is being able to contribute to the playlist. Does that make sense? A lot of people think only about diversity, but inclusion and equity are just as important, if not more. Uh, here's just a bold statement. May I, may I be so bold? Like women matter, <laughs> non-binary folk matter, POC matter, queer folk matter. And if we don't like figure out how to get more uh, of these underserved populations into our industry, we're just like doing ourselves a disservice. Um, POC are actually 14% more likely than non-POC to be ready to call it quits in the design industry as a as a whole. Now, there's been very little research on the type industry of like how much more POC are willing to quit specifically with our, with regards to the type industry, but I imagine it's more than 14%. A queer folk are actually 40% more likely than uh, non-queer folk to be ready to call it quits. So like people are actually leaving or thinking about leaving, which is like a problem. Um, in 1991, uh, the design industry was about 93% white. This was uh, sourced by AIGA, and like now it's 71% white. And at our current pace, it's going to take about 30 years to re reach fit parity, right? Um, yikes. Uh, and also, people of color are actively being discriminated, um, whether it's super apparent to us or not, um, due, um, and they're leaving, like partly or wholly due to discrimination. So uh, in other words, if you have three people of color in your workplace, there's pretty much a 100% chance that one of them is going to leave due to discrimination within under two years, which is super scary. Um, this is just something I made. I think this is really dope. I think this would like look really good on a t-shirt. Like beef or brown? Like are you fucking kidding me? That's lit as fuck, dude. Um, okay. Um, okay. And then there's also like this huge knowledge gap. Like people think about if they're gonna go into a specific career based on this college paradigm, like when they're in high school. Like how could we reach out more to high schoolers um, rather than college students or beyond to be like this industry is dope. You could really make a huge impact on it. So I think we need to figure out as an industry how to tap into high school networks and like high school organizations um, to figure out how to um, figure out how to address this issue of a knowledge gap. Um, people of color are about 55% of people of color are saying that the, one of the reasons why they're not progressing in the industry is due to a lack of mentorship. So you can just have to figure out like how do we mentor more people? Like could you? Add on your Instagram profile, your LinkedIn profile, like, hey, I'm down to be a mentor. Let's 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 talk, right? These are really complicated issues, but like, I really wanted to talk about them. Um, also, hiring is really hard. Like, it's hard. It's hard. It's really really hard when I hear like, hey, there aren't enough brown designers. Of course, I'm going to hire somebody else or whatever. And it's like kind of on us to um, figure out and take the extra effort to like lo find those folks. Like, there's Latinxes who design. There's women who draw. Com, right? There's black suit design. There's like a lot of really good resources, and if like you're trying to figure out like how do I find um, a, a person who's underrepresented in this industry, like try to reach out to those networks and see if like they have any advice, right? Okay, it's super hard to make money when you're a typographer. I'm not a typographer, but I that's right here. Um, like you work on a typeface for like let's say five, ten years, and you're like, okay, I hope I make five hundred bucks from it, right? Like it sucks. Um, so I have an idea, and feel free to steal this. Um, I feel like as typographers, anybody in the audience, 
I feel like you should be focusing on two stages of a company for new business. Now hear me out. Um, there are f generally five stages of a business. There's like just an idea, right? Stage of a business where like your aunt is like, hey, Ratish, I have this great idea for a backpack company. And she like never starts it. And it's like every year she's telling you about this backpack company idea, right? Like there's that. And then there's like public. There's like Uber, booty babdy, right? Could have been WeWork, but uh, <laughs> RIP. Okay, so there's like all these stages in between uh, just an idea in public. And based on the stage, they're gonna, they're gonna be willing to take on more or less risk. They're gonna be compensating you differently. They're gonna be focusing on something different and they're gonna have different challenges. So I'm not gonna go through all this. I'm happy to stay behind or answer uh, texts or emails uh, on this. But in my opinion, typographers should be focusing on seed funded companies where they've got a little bit of money. They just got funded. Um, they might even give you equity because like they're desperate, they need to uh, save cash, and they're probably down to take a lot of risk. And they're probably down to take a little bit more risk than a later stage company. This is where like you could probably pitch like two typefaces, one that's pretty experimental, pretty dramatic, and, and a body typeface that's like whatever, and they'll probably buy it, right? Um, public companies, on the other hand, again, like Uber, blah, 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 like they're much less, uh, they're much more risk averse. Like they don't want to take on risk, but they're probably going to pay you like make it rain in this bitch, right? So um, something that you should do is reach out to seed funded companies, do the experimental design, and then hit up public companies and be like, hey, Airbnb, I could save you about a million point, what, like $1.2 million on your typeface. Out pops cereal box, right? That typeface. Or like go to Netflix and be like, hey, like I want to make a new typeface. Out pops like Netflix stands or whatever it's called. So I think there's a huge opportunity to have your cake and eat it too, where you can do experimental stuff, get paid for it and equity, and then also get paid like mad money by public companies. This isn't really something that's being done right now, and I think you guys should do it because <laughs> uh, you can make money. Um, this is where I'll probably end, and this is like where I'm super, super hype on. We don't really know the business value of a font. Do you? Like if you create a typeface, could you say, hey, Ratish, this, this typeface compared to a different typeface is gonna generate 1.2 more million dollars for you than the other typeface? Could you say that to me? Nope. Uh, so I have an idea <laughs> for how to do that. And it's like, just stay with me. <laughs> I promise, it's gonna be, I promise. Just please stay. Um, okay, we already did that. All right, so we at least don't know the value of a typeface, or at least it's really difficult to find. I'm not aware of any studies that are out right now that could say like, hey, this typeface will lead to more sales than another. Um, the business value and helping answering this question is really hard to find online. Like if I type in do fonts matter, um, there's kind of like this like not great like medium article that shows up in like a uh, in a box at the very top that pretty much just says like it's good for branding. We already we already kind of know that right. Um, and then it's nice that it says the same thing. And then Ranker.com says 29 design fails that prove that fonts really do matter. Right, but there isn't really like an answer here. Um, if I type in the business value of a font, the first thing that shows up is should your business only use one font? Like that's not the answer to what I want. <laughs> Then if I type in the value of a font, right? W3 schools pop, pops up, which is like a coding thing, right? CSS font property, I don't care about that. Then there's value sans, which is like a decent typeface, no shade on whoever created that, but it's like whatever. Um, I don't really, this isn't answering my question. Um, so this is just one more reason why the uninitiated don't pay for good fonts. There's a lot of reasons why people don't pay for good fonts, but if they're literally trying to prove to like their client or their boss or their mom or their aunt to pay just 50 bucks for a decent typeface, they can't actually find that information. Um, and we're really gonna struggle as an industry if we don't like actually figure out how to put numbers behind these things. It's kind of like asking a movie director, like, hey, Tim Burton, can you prove to me that using your crazy costumes in your movie is gonna lead to like more ticket sales? Like, you, you can't, you, he can't do that. I don't think he's willing to do either, right? Am I making sense? I kind of blacked out, okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, then, but we do know a few things. We do, we do know a few things. We know that design makes impact. Companies with strong design like outperform their competitors. Like that's a thing. That was like done by McKinsey, who got paid probably way too much money to do, to, to figure that out. So just like tell companies that, right? I'd rather tell you this so you could show it to a potential client, so you could waste less time 
trying to get new business and like actually doing real, <laughs> real good work, right? Um, we also know that good type is good for branding. It's, it reflects a feeling, oh, maron, it's like, look, it's the flowers, right? We know that, we already know like, that it's good for branding. We do know, based on UX uh, research, that people skim headlines. They're actually use, like reading type uh, and pages before getting into the details. People do care more about headlines first than body copy. That's a fact. We also do know that speed matters. Like the speed of a, how, how, how fast a, a website loads is directly correlated to money that you make. Like a one second improvement to site speed could literally fund your type project. It could prevent like a type foundry from closing. Um, just as an example, like you can look this up in Google and just plug in like, a, a, like your client's website or something. If you plug in like example, 100,000 monthly visitors, um, so basically 100,000 people are coming to your site a month. Each of them are buying about $40 whenever they buy and they, buy, and they purchase around 2% of the time. Like going from a 2.2 2 second, 2 .2 second um, site speed to 1.1 second site speed could literally mean more than 62 grand in recovered revenue, right? This is money that you could be using for your type project. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we also do know that good type leads to quicker reading, more focus, sense of clarity. But like, no shade on Kevin or Rosalind, um, but like their study like didn't really tell us much. It basically just said like, hey, look, good typography is better than bad typography. Like we already knew that, right? And like, Come on, like that's not like really usable, and like the spacing was bad, like everything was really bad in that in that second second idea. Like, of course, it's gonna uh, be um, concluded that way. So here's my thing, and this is a really this is gonna be like ugh, ugh, ugh. I, I know. Like, what if we looked at good type versus crazy type versus bad type, right? And actually compared the performance of each of those three buckets. Let's just see what happens, right? Okay, so here's what I define as good type. Good not meaning like, hey, this is like, <coughs> like pretentiously good. It's more of like, hey, these are generally typefaces that don't offend me, right? <laughs> um, crazy is more like, again, not a cr pretentious view of crazy. It's more of like, these typefaces aren't really generally utilized in like mass ways. Like, don't at me and say, like, oh, Ratish, everyone uses Cooper Black in New York City. Yeah, okay, right. But, like, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is the dyslexic uh, typeface uh, called dys dyslexi. Um, I put it in crazy um, because it's, like, not traditionally used and it's actually shown to help improve uh, readability for people who are dyslexic, which I think is probably kind of cool. Um, and then there's, like, bad type. Now, this is, like, stuff that's generally understood as just, like, Bad, right? And okay, I put nine here, I put nine typefaces here, but I put five here because I was just like, God, I can't put more on here. This is bad. There's papyrus, which is like your mom probably uses for like her yoga class. Uh, <laughs> there's Cooper Black, oh, I'm sorry, Comic Sans, which is uh, traditionally treated as like a bad typeface. It does actually promote accessibility for people who have trouble reading, so like that's cool, but like it's generally considered bad. Uh, Gil Sands, uh, the guy who made it, is, is a bad person. Um, you have Ariel Black, uh, which is kind of like usable, but like kind of bad. And then you have like Impact, which is like, oh God, yeah, right. Uh, so like, what if we run A-B tests on this? Uh, this is gonna be, okay, I promise you, just stay with me. This could turn out really well for the type industry, or it could turn out really, really poorly. <laughs> yeah, A-B test, yeah, woo. Um, okay, so the outcomes of testing typography like on your site, and again, you're testing <laughs> Cooper Black, like let's, let's just take an example. Like you're testing Comic Sans versus Cooper Black in the top versus, uh, oh man, there's so many beautiful type here. Uh, somebody, somebody name, can somebody identify one of these? Futura. All right, fine. Future. I have some issues with it, but yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> I can't like ask you to like your opinion and be like, nah, it's a bad opinion, right? But yeah, let's go with it. All right, so Futura versus Cooper Black uh, versus Comic Sans, right? That's that's the paradigm that we're setting up. So you're gonna be like, hey, um, somebody, uh, I'm gonna put these typefaces onto your website, and like 33 percent, 33 point repeated percent of uh, people are gonna get. 
uh, one type face, uh, another uh, third are going to get another type face, and the last third are going to get another type face. Does this make sense? And what we're going to do is we're going to say, which one of these type faces actually leads to more sales? Right? Is anybody, everybody with me? So like, what percentage of people uh, comparatively between each of the type faces are going to generate more sales than, than the other? Okay. This could be really, really good for the industry. It could be really bad, or it could be like really, really bad. Um, <laughs> so let's say a good font wins against a bad font. We already saw a study. Like I don't think we're having that problem <laughs> here necessarily here, but like, okay, good. Let's say you test Cooper Black versus like another one that's in the in the quote unquote good good one. Or wait, that was uh, no Futura, right? Futura versus like uh, Futura Bolt. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So like that's good. All right, great. Good, good's winning. Great. Now if good beats crazy, okay, Futura still wins. Okay, if good e Futura equals Futura, okay, great. We're good. This is good scenario. This is like good type is beating everything else. That's good. We're happy with this. Like we'll basically be in the traditional paradigm that we're in, where we will have to like say, hey client, like assuming you don't have bad taste, like here's a typeface that I think you should do. Please buy it. Right. Then there's crazy wins. This is a typeface, this is a paradigm where I would argue if we can get to this, we could fundamentally unlock billions of dollars in the type industry wherein we just create the most crazy ass typography and just put it out because we're like, hey, crazy type actually beats like bad or good type, right? So this scenario is like crazy beats good, right? Okay, cool. Crazy beats bad, hopefully. Um, crazy beats a, another crazy font or crazy equals good. Now the reason why I think crazy wins in this one is because if crazy performs just as good as good, you could just make the argument being like, hey, you're not losing any more money, so let's just go crazy, right? <laughs> All right, then there's a uh, dystopia. This is like where shit can get really messy. What if we run a test, MIT Media Lab, like Ratish Gupta Enterprises, like whoever, like runs this test and bad type wins. We're really fucked. Um, if, there's a, if, there's, is, if there's statistical significance that shows that papyrus, n like 100% of the time, will beat out anything else, we are super, super screwed. Um, and this is like a huge issue. Like on one hand, we have to chew, I, in my opinion, we have to prove the business value of a typeface. But if, we, if the results sway in this dystopia world, uh, typographers, uh, it might be bad, right? So we probably won't actually do this experiment because there isn't enough brave people out in the world who are willing to bear these consequences of being like, yo, I just proved that like papyrus is the end all be all. Like no one wants to bear that like burden. <laughs> no one does. Um, but like we could create the conditions where it might work, wherein we actually test typography right before an official rebrand, right? So you go to Uber and be like, hey, we want to test papyrus. And we want to test uh, Futura, and we want to test Cooper Black, because um, the Uber is like rebranding anyways, right? So they have nothing to lose. But again, if Papyrus wins, like it's gonna be really bad. So in conclusion, <laughs> uh, one is missing. I don't know why that's happening. That's that's bad. That's that's bad typography. Uh, you guess like you guess what that conclusion is. Um, like it's really hard to find the right font. Uh, there's a lack of diversity in the industry. Uh, it's hard to make money. There's a lack of awareness of impact to type. Um, but like, I am hoping that you saw that like hyperfluid relationships are like really good, right? Meet ASAP with your clients. Meet ASAP with your type people. Meet ASAP with whomever you're working with. Share stuff constantly. Be brave. Be fearless. Like you never know when like a certain insight, like what dog, what color dogs can see, will pop up. Share the aesthetics you care about, what you like, what you don't. And most importantly, like why you care about them and why you don't. Um, send feedback, just keep pushing on the work, right? Um, and then, like, once you've talked to your uh, relationship people, agency, typographer, whatever, like, just let them do their thing. Let the experts be experts and let them just go into a hole. It's okay to, like, separate um, and allow them to do their thing. Uh, again, find fonts that mean something. We need to really explore the craziest option and push our collaborators to do something really extreme. Um, because chances are, if you dial it back, it's going to feel right. Uh, and then also, oh, in conclusion, right, the one is showing up. Okay, great. Uh, we need to educate people about type. It's really not hard to educate people about type, um, but like we, we just need to like make the resources to do it. Um, we need to make it easier to stay updated on new, new typefaces. 
uh, through Instagram or wherever actual people, like lay people actually are. Uh, we need to fit, fix font organization, so like hit up your myfonts.com, coolfonts.com, whatever uh, I showed you, I don't remember. Um, and try to get them to think about font organization that actually promotes accessibility uh, for people who actually are generally interested in it, but like aren't type, uh, pretentious type people. And, um, and then we need to figure out how to deal with like these contexts. Again, I pose this question of like, hey, should we be using Froctor or any sort of black letter inspired typeface? Do we have an obligation to, as typography people, to use it or not? Um, and if people are using it, do we have the obligation to say like, hey, don't do that? Or should we just let, let it be? Um, and then we also have to figure out like how to get more underrepresented populations in type. I provided a few different ideas. I think we should be all changing our Instagram profiles or, or uh, email, or like our um, email like signatures and be like, yo, I'm down to mentor you if you're down. Another thing I, I'm really fascinated by is this idea of uh, mentoring both ways. Oftentimes a younger folk like think that they need to be mentored, but like you can learn as an older person just as much from them as they uh, they can from you. So I would I would challenge us to actually go outside of our industry and be like, hey, I know typography, I know branding, I know photography, whatever. I'm down to teach you some of this stuff if you're down to teach me something else, right? This beautiful like skill knowledge sharing will only make our industry stronger. We need to fix the traditional business model. Go after experimental stuff with all you got. Hit up seed funded companies that have money, might be willing to give you equity because you can make a killing if that company like takes off. Uh, and then also go after like the really big corporations to like figure out how you can like make that Skrilla. And then last uh, but not least is we need to really figure out and grapple with the fact that we don't understand the true business value of type and if we're actually willing to take the actual steps that's needed to actually prove that out. Uh, we're super privileged. We can fucking do this. I promise you. Thank you. <laughs>